hello, hello. Welcome to Be Bold America. I'm your host, Jill Cody, and I'm joined today by Mike Clancy, who is a frequent lecturer on climate change and is the current chair of the Monterey County chapter of the Citizens Climate Lobby. Mike also serves on the question review team for the annual Leon Panetta Lecture Series. He is the former scientific and technical director of the Navy's Fleet Numerical Meteorology and Oceanography Center in Monterey and a recipient of the Navy's highest civilian award, the Distinguished Civilian Service Award. Hi, Mike. Thank you for joining me again today. Welcome back to Be Bold America. <laughs> hey, thanks, Jill. I always enjoy hosting this show. It's a lot of fun. And we have a great show today because we have two outstanding uh, guests here. Our first esteemed guest is uh, Monterey County Supervisor Mary Adams. Mary has had a 30-year career of public service, solving problems for local families. Elected in 2016 and re-elected in 2020 as the 5th District Supervisor of Monterey County. Mary advocates on issues ranging from disaster and economic recovery to land use to creative solutions to our county's housing and homelessness crisis. Our next esteemed guest is Monterey County Supervisor Glenn Church, who is a fourth generation North Monterey County resident. He was born in Salinas and grew up in the Elkhorn Royal Oaks area. Glenn is the son of a former county supervisor, Warren Church, and Glenn learned the vital significance of public service and that government should make life easier for people rather than being an obstacle. Welcome, Mary and Glenn, to Be Bold America. Thank you for having us. Yes, thank you very much for having us. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Glenn. Mary, Mike and I attended your presentation to the Monterey County Democratic Women's Club about the climate challenges the county is urgently facing, and you both graciously accepted making the presentation again on KSQD for a larger listening audience. Uh, thank you for that. And if I remember correctly, Mary, you began by talking about the Sober Rains fire. Is that where you'd like to start today, or do you have a different place you'd like to start? Well, I can follow your lead. Um, we wanted, I will uh, speak about the Sober Rains fire. I think perhaps maybe a little background would be good for both uh, Glenn and me. Go so for the it. the audience has an idea of uh, who we are and what we do. Yes. Um, just to let, let you know, I think um, I covered it certainly for me that I've uh, been in public service most of my life. My career was in the not-for-profit sector. And I was delighted to um, run for first for office after I'd retired from United Way, where I'd served as CEO for 14 years. And my expectation is that I would be serving the community in the same way, but just on a bigger platform. And there was a certain amount of, uh, of uh, truth to that. That really is true. But at United Way, we covered health and human service issues, not nearly the important issues of land use, planning, um, climate change. And so it's been a really wonderful seven years of learning and experiencing all of the difference in the importance of what we have to deal with in, uh, in our county because it is such a diverse um, uh, area. I have chosen not to run for third term, so this, I'm in my eighth and final year on the Board of Supervisors. I'm uh, pleased to be able to retire. I, uh, I felt like eight years is about the right amount of time for someone to serve. There are three people who are, going, who are choosing to run for my seat, and um, I am hopeful that um, uh, I know one of them will win. My hope is that one of them will win in, in uh, March, and we wouldn't have to go on to the, um, to the general election, but we could get it handled in the uh, primary. Um, uh, there is a, a woman who worked for me for a number of years, um, and then there is a gentleman who is um, active in the city of Monterey, and another person who lives over in the Salinas area, but still within the district. Well, let me so take, my, take this opportunity, Mary, just to thank you for your service. Thank you very much. I know you chose not to run again, and, and uh, you've done a marvelous job, so thank you. Well, thanks. That's very kind, Jill. Now, see if Glenn wants to do a little background as well. Sure. Yes, I'd be, um, be happy to. As, uh, as pointed out, I'm a long-time resident, well, lifetime resident, I should really say, of, uh, of North Monterey County. And I um, am, while Mary's coming to the end of her, her time on the board in her eighth year, I'm actually just uh, starting my second year. So I've only had about a year on the board. I'm um, as pretty familiar with the way 
Board of Supervisors operate. As was mentioned, my, my dad was on the Board of Supervisors during that long, quite a while ago, um, almost 50 years ago, and I was, during a period that I was, was growing up. But I basically can say many of the, the same things back then that were issues are, are issues now. Climate change is not one of them because that's obviously something that's a lot more more recent in our concerns. I uh, I ran uh, basically because I felt that that there was more more um, more representation from um, from the people, particularly up in North County, which I felt it hadn't been done for some time. I felt that there needed to be uh, trying to trying to be government to kind of work a little bit um, a, a little bit more effectively with a lot of basic problems people have. Of course, what we're dealing with on climate change is a, a totally different ball game, basically, just to um, to express here. It's a um, it's a real uh, it's a real challenging issue, not just at the local level, but the state, the national, and of course, the international level. And it is something that's not going to be affecting us just here. It'll affect people in neighboring counties and all around the world. So, uh, I think all of us look um, look at this as a real challenge, and we're trying to find some you know, innovative and effective means in which to um, in which to accomplish uh, what needs to be done. Well, I heard Mary uh, say that a different way to say, I always thought it was sober rains, but you pronounce it differently, Mary. <laughs> Is it yes, soberanis? Soberanic. Soberanis. Okay. All right. Yeah. Now, yeah. I, I, yeah. I've got to say it right. Uh, Mike, do you have a question? Yes, I do. Um, Supervisor Church, despite the very wet year we experienced in 2023, Worsening drought brought about by climate change remains one of the biggest long-term threats facing California, and especially your district with all the agricultural interests there. Can you talk a bit about the current status of groundwater management in the Salinas Valley and what the implications for local agriculture will be in the face of long-term increasing drought? Sure. Well, my district actually is a, um, is a district that doesn't hang include a huge chunk of the Salinas Valley, just the area north of Salinas and towards Castorville. So there's most of the Salinas Valley uh, and the agricultural needs are, are really going to be south of there. But yeah, groundwater, yes, definitely this is this is an issue not just for agriculture, it's an issue for, for everybody uh, everywhere as we're facing um, as many challenges into there. And even though we're, we're getting into these, these unpredictable periods and We've had droughts. We had a serious, serious drought here just 10 years ago that went on for quite a few years. We also hit these periods where we have these huge amounts of rain that come down since this last year. And we're heading into a fairly wet year this year. We, uh, out, of, um, out of my place uh, back in 2017 when the drought was broken, I had 50 inches of rain um, we recorded that year. I've never, never seen anywhere near that. 18 to 20 inches is generally what we get. So 50 inches of rain is a tremendous amount. I remember a uh, former supervisor you know, who recently passed away, Luke Haltagna, who lives right at the Moss Landing area, which gets very little rain. He counted that they got over 20 inches of rain. So we, as we look at this, it's hard to see you know, with climate change. We can't really say, well, we're heading into periods where we're getting less water. As a matter of fact, I believe the state is even estimating that we might even get more water. But the problem is we also might get these these real wet spells, which means we have to deal with some water storage. We might hit some really dry spells, which means that we have, um, we've, we've got to be able to have those resources available. And, of course, with the higher temperatures that we have, you're going to get a lot more evaporation. So even though we might get more water, there might be less available. So it's a real complicated mix as as we look at this issue and how it goes in, but there's a lot of projects that are going on, not just in, in our county, but all throughout the state, um, dealing with groundwater sustainability, which is what uh, Governor Brown just about 10 years ago put forth in some legislation. So you have areas such as the Salinas Valley, the Pajaro Valley, which have these groundwater sustainability agencies, which means that we've got to go through and find a way to make sure that we're not taking any more water out than what is going in by the year 2040. And that is one of the real challenges. Well, uh, Glenn, just to add on to um, a personal story about the amount of water in the atmospheric rivers, 
Last March 14th, there was an atmospheric river hitting Monterey County, and my husband and I lost seven Monterey pines in our front yard that day, one of which was so huge, uh, the pine was threatening our house. The, the, uh, we got um, uh, tree cutters there during the storm, and we sat in our car all day long watching them take down these huge trees. Uh, they couldn't stand in the dirt anymore. They were just falling over. So, you know, this is one personal story of how people are in impacted by the climate crisis. Uh, Mary, now uh, you've taught me how to say sober on us, fire. <laughs> so uh, can you talk a little bit about the damages and, you know, and how yes. what's been going on in the county? Yes, thank you for that. Yeah, actually, when you were discussing taking down all those pine trees, I thought, gee, she must live up in my neighborhood. <laughs> this was the same sort of situation. <laughs> I had a tree that came through the roof of my home. Oh, no. And while my guys were up just putting a tarp on to, to try to, to cover it up, three more trees came down on my property. So, it, you know, last year was a quite the year. It was but tough. At any rate, it was. So with the Sobranes fire, that was really an interesting situation. It was, at the time, the largest forest fire that had ever hit uh, the state of California. It was more, well more than 100,000 acres. Of course, there have been many more tragic fires since, but at that time, it was the, uh, it was the largest. And some of the things that happened during that fire is, is, that are, still have ramifications. As an example, the um, Palo Colorado Canyon is an area that um, really suffered a lot from the fire. Going all the way down to Big Sur, we had so many different areas that were impacted by the fire. And the fire happens, and it's horrible, and people suffer. People lose their homes. The fire chief um, down in Big Sur, uh, the volunteer fire department, not in the Sobranis fire, but she lost her home two times. It's really, it's really tough um, oh how people are impacted by the fire. But really, it's the aftermath that is so difficult. And a couple of examples I can give you. One of the aftermaths of Soberani's fire was the, um, and the atmospheric river, of course, that came afterwards, is that the whole of Palo Colorado Canyon was just massively inundated. I mean, trees and muds and creeks, and it, it was just impossible to, um, to traverse it. To this day, to this day, that many years later, seven years later, that road is still not completely open. It is, I remember going up there when it first happened, and it looked as if a dinosaur had taken just a huge bite out of, um, uh, out of the, the uh, uh, hill on which the road had been built. It, it remains very, it, almost impossible to fix. It's very, very difficult. And that, of course, is, has an impact on people who want to use the, the, the uh, forest, the U.S. forest, because they can't uh, get up to hike back in the, uh, in the back area up there because it's still impacted. One of the most um, other uh, aspects of that fire, though, again, again, from the mud and the slides and the atmospheric river, was when um, the bridge at uh, Sycamore Canyon, Pfeiffer uh, Creek Bridge, went down. And that was, honestly, it felt before that happened, we felt as if we were starting to make some progress. We've made some progress on, the, on um, the Paul Colorado Canyon Road. We've made some progress further down the coast on opening up Highway 1 because it had been closed in three different places. And we were all so thrilled that finally things are starting to happen and we're getting back on track. I remember and that then, because I couldn't get to the radio uh, the studio here. <laughs> I'm not surprised. Yeah. And then the bridge failed, and we had to close the, the bridge at, uh, at Paul Colorado Canyon. But in addition to that, the road was still closed a bit south. So we had an area of uh, Big Sur that was totally isolated. People couldn't get in, and they couldn't get out. And it was such a serious issue. I can't even tell you how bad this was. We had many families. Children couldn't go to school. People couldn't get food. They couldn't get fuel. They were running out of pet food. They were running out of wine. It was really something. <laughs> this is serious. So, it was serious. So finally, my um, Health and Human Service United Way background intersected with my uh, planning and uh, uh, climate change background. And it was really pretty exciting because we did, um, in, with the help of so many people from Big Sur specifically, 
and the um, uh, the Department of Emergency Services, we did a helicopter drop, and we had a helicopter that we uh, hired from down in South County, in uh, San Luis Obispo County, who flew up to Big Sur State Park. We had volunteer fire people on the south, north side of the bridge and volunteer fire people on the south side of the bridge. We had gotten a grocery list from all of the people who lived in Big Sur through CABS, the um, Community Association of Big Sur, what people needed. And we sent those lists to uh, volunteers from the uh, Carmel Unified School District who went to Safeway and did all the grocery shopping. The folks at Safeway helped, and then we had third volunteers who took all the groceries in boxes, put them in the back of pickup trucks that a number of us drove down to Big Sur. We had the helicopter come down. The fire people put the um, the boxes of food into these big, like, nets and then went over. It took maybe seven minutes to cross over the bridge to drop them off. The other, heli- the other uh, fire people unloaded, came back over, and did it again and again. As I was going through this, um, I had somebody had put a box of, uh, of, you know, to be taken across of an open box in the truck I was driving, and so I, as I was carrying it over to put it inside the helicopter, I just I noticed what it was, and it was clear to me that it was schoolwork. Oh and my! And so I looked at it, and there was a note on the top of one of the pages as I was carrying it across, and it said, "Sarah, we really miss you in science class." <laughs> and it was such a clear statement wow. and of what was really happening here. These poor kids, you know, they couldn't even go to school. Mm. It was one of the most meaningful things that, you know, that I see. Every time now that we experience disasters, like the most recent one with, in Pablo, you know that there are all of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of lives who are just impacted in ways that we can't even envision. That's right. Well, let's take a break. You are listening to Be Bold America on KSQD 90.7 FM. Many voices, one station. Listen globally online from the KSQD.org website. Our topic today is the climate crisis hits Monterey County. And our guests are Monterey County Board of Supervisors Mary Adams and Glenn Church. My guest co-host Mike Clancy serves as chair of the Monterey County chapter of the Citizens Climate Lobby. I'm your host, Jill Cody. KSQD thanks attorney Ned Hearn for supporting this program. Ned Hearn specializes in intellectual property and business law with a focus on entertainment, internet, and computer software business and their convergence, intersecting content, media, and technology in the digital environment. More info at www.internetmedialaw.com. Thank you, Ned Hearn, for supporting KSQD 90.7 FM. What can you do to reunite this country and save our democracy? These heady issues will be discussed on KSQD 90.7 FM, Be Bold America. Be Bold America is a live, bi-weekly talk show for those who are motivated to step out of their daily routine. On Be Bold America, we will be discussing what you can keep doing, stop doing, and start doing to take action. We have big things to do. Every other Sunday at 5 p.m. on K-Squid, community radio for the Monterey Bay. We're back. Would you like a friend to hear this interview on The Climate Crisis Hits Monterey County? Well, Be Bold America is available as a podcast on Apple, Google, Spotify, YouTube, and many others. Subscribe for free from your favorite platform. Mike, I know you're sitting there with a question, (laughs) probably lots of questions. (laughs) Thanks, Jill. Uh, Supervisor Church, perhaps the biggest impact from the atmospheric rivers that hit us in 2023 was the terrible flooding that devastated Pajaro. Can you provide some background on why the levee failed to contain the Pajaro River during this flooding event? And what's being done to correct this problem? Sure, I'd uh, be happy to um, to talk about that. So, well, we got some unusually heavy rains out of there with, with not just one atmospheric river, but multiple ones that just went on. And it was, there was a period of about two months or longer in which we were under a, kind of a constant threat of, of um, a flooding going on out of there, and it's particularly in the, uh, the Pajaro area. But there's... It's really an issue that is goes deeper than just the climate change in the atmospheric rivers. For the for the Mono um, Valley, the Mono River, 
coming down there. The watershed goes way up into the mountains of San Benito and Santa Clara County. So you had some of the dams up there, such as the Hernandez Reservoir up in Santa Clara, that had filled up, and they couldn't hold the water anymore. They had to start releasing water. So we continued to have these rains. We continued to, um, to have this uh, water coming in from, from various streams into the, uh, to the, the Baja River. And uh, there weren't reservoirs to help prevent any of that flood and flood threatening. And so that began to raise the, uh, the levels of the, uh, of the water. However, it's, it, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a complicated issue here on what really could have caused the, the flooding um, and everything that broke. The levee did break. It was a very old levee. It was built back in 1947. There's different standards in 1947. The Army Corps of Engineers actually uh, in 1965 said that this isn't really adequate because in 47 it was built and 55 and I believe 57 and it, it flooded both of those times. Um, my, my family is somewhat um, affected by that. Both my parents were teachers in Bajaro and that 55 flood it was actually before I was born and I had two older sisters who were students there. Uh, so they were part of that early flooding on down to there and nothing was really done to correct that until we just the last few years where some of our, um, our state and federal legislators uh, have um, which we're really grateful for everything they've been able to put together on this we're able to raise the money so that the, the levy can be rebuilt and that process is going to be taking place starting next year and it's going to be an ongoing process for some time to really bring it up to current standards. Uh, you know, we have to realize this, the Paro Valley itself is a flood zone. No matter what you do, you can never stop Mother Nature. And, of course, Mother Nature with climate change has a little uh, more enhanced fury uh, to her. So it's, 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 it makes things a real challenge. Really, I think we're looking at it just a combination of many different factors that led to what had happened there where the breach occurred. And what has been done is that there were actually multiple breaches on there. There were three major ones. One that happened uh, upstream that affected the community of Pajaro. Another one at where the river goes underneath the Highway 1 bridge. And another down closer to the Pajaro dunes just before it goes out in the ocean. Now, the, where the, the, rift, the breach was, at what we call Site 1, up in the uh, Pajaro, uh, the Pajaro Valley up where, where it caused the flooding for the um, that's where the houses are. Um, yeah, that, well, that's not where the houses were, but that's what caused the uh, the flooding of the houses. That one has been all completely repaired. At uh, some vegetation, we've been able to do a core, you know, through, within guide within the state and the federal guidelines that allow us have been cleared out, and it's been built up, it's been firmed up, it's in better shape than it's probably been for decades. So I feel very comfortable about that particular part. Uh, the other two uh, uh, have also been worked on particularly down at the one at the very mouth of, of where the river basically gets into the ocean down there. That one was recently finished down there, which was basically plenty a lot of agricultural fields. And the Army Corps of Engineers, which is doing these repairs because the levee is owned by the Army Corps, they're now turning their attention to the area around the, the Highway 1 uh, breach that took place there. And their hope is they're going to have that done in the next few weeks. So that basically gives you a summary of, of what's happened and what is being intended here in the future. Great. Thanks for that. Uh, coming back to long-term drought in our area and remembering the devastating fires that have struck the county over the years, what's the county's plan for mitigating wildfire risk? And in particular, what's the plan for dealing with the proliferation of eucalyptus trees in the county, which present a significant wildfire risk? Oh, you're talking to the eucalyptus expert here with Mr. Church. Okay. Well, I, I have I have a real concern about eucalyptus as uh, as we that they're large matchsticks. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's a good way yeah, to that's try a good it. Way you to know, say and, uh, uh, torches might be even a better. Yeah, phrase giant off. torches. So, and, and, <laughs> and it, it's a problem. It's a problem everywhere. I I read how eucalyptus were planted in Spain. And they have been really concerned about them there too. I mean, these trees, they grow very tall. They, they are very detrimental to the native, uh, the native flora and fauna. Uh, it's very, you know, beneficial to very, very few of them. They're, uh, they have oils that just 
very, you know, it's just, they can just turn, as you say, into matchsticks, into, into torches. And, and, and my district in North County is where there's a heavy, heavy concentration of them, a couple thousand acres onto them. I um, actually you know, was working with Senator uh, Laird this last year, and I really want to thank him and his staff for, for what they've been able to do. But they have given them a range for Monterey County to get a, a million uh, dollars for a pilot project on eucalyptus removal, which we are just in the, uh, the process of finalizing at this point. And so we're hoping to try to to see how that works in some of these areas and, and help um, homeowners be able to go through and remove, uh, remove some of these around their homes to have divisible space because it isn't cheap to get rid of a, whatever these trees are, 50, 70 feet tall. It's very expensive. Uh, I, I like to look at what the Elkhorn Slough Foundation has been doing along the Elkhorn Slough. And they have taken a very aggressive approach with a lot of different grants where they have gone through and and removed the eucalyptus and have gone through and chipped the uh, chipped the trees, laid them out, and have created a, a program where they're going to be bringing back the native plants out of there. It is uh, there's one stretch along Elkhorn Road, which the removal of eucalyptus has just transformed the, the view from the road. And I have, from the, from the folks in, in my district who have seen that, I have had universal appreciation for that. Because suddenly you can look out to the slough, you can look out to Moss Landing, you can look out to the ocean, you can see the Monterey Peninsula. And so it's, you know, that's just more of an aesthetic approach onto it. But they have some 70 acres of eucalyptus, and they're removing almost all of them. Not all of them, because there's, there's a few people. You know, we're never going to get rid of all the eucalyptus, and they do provide... Some benefit for some species, this is the monarch butterflies in a few places, but I've been a big advocate of saying, let's get rid of eucalyptus, let's bring back the redwoods, which used to be in many areas through this county, and which would provide the same kind of habitat. Um, in North Monterey County, for example, there used to be a, a very extensive redwood grove, which was taken out in the, um, in the 1800s because of valuable you know, lumber of, of redwood. So I've been trying to urge, um, let's replant some of these back. And I think, you know, if we, if we can get rid of eucalyptus, um, the more we can get rid of, we can bring, if we need to have one half taller trees, let's bring back some native ones. The redwoods are a fine example. And yeah, that's kind of where we're at right now on the, uh, on the eucalyptus. Okay, let's take a break. You're listening to Be Bold America on KSQD 90.7 FM, 89.5 and 89.7 FM. Many Voices, One Station. Listen globally online from the ksqd.org website. My guest co-host, Mike Clancy, who chairs the Monterey County chapter of Citizens Climate Lobby, and I are speaking with our two bold guests, Mary Adams and Glenn Church, both elected Monterey County Board of Supervisors. We will be right back after Jim Hightower's commentary titled, Why You Were Not Invited to Davos. Once again, my invitation to the big shindig in Davos never arrived. Davos is the posh resort village in the Swiss Alps, where some 3,000 global power elites gather every January for a week-long corporate-funded schmooze and booze fest to solve the world's problems. You and I are never invited to this confab, grandiosely titled World Economic Forum. That's because, one, we're not corporate or governmental VIPs, and two, we might raise rude questions like, who the hell elected you plutocratic know-nothings and screw-ups to solve world problems, which you largely created? See, we the people can't be trusted to be polite. Indeed, the theme of this year's forum is, how can we rebuild trust? By we, they mean the Davos clique itself, the Wall Street bankers, Silicon Valley speculators, oligarchs, industrial barons, billionaire campaign donors, polluters, high-tech futurists, and other architects of, well, the mess we're in. In our country, only about 10% say democracy is working for most Americans today, with the powers that be not even trying to serve what the majority believes in, wants, and needs. Economic fairness, social justice, and equal opportunity – our society's fundamental unifying values are being trampled by the greed of moneyed elites and the fear and hatred of small-minded ideological extremists. 
They squabble over even keeping our government operating and fritter away their time and credibility on crap that undermines public trust. This is Jim Hightower saying, So no, DeVos crowd, you cannot rebuild trust, for no one can trust you. You could gain a real measure of credibility if your elite forum would do something truly significant for democracy, like taking corporate money out of our politics. That would make DeVos historic. Otherwise, you're just partying and stroking your egos. The Hightower Radio Lowdown is made possible by you subscribers to Jim Hightower's Lowdown on Substack. Find us at jimhightower.substack.com. We're back. My guest co-host Mike Clancy and I are interviewing Monterey County Supervisors Mary Adams and Glenn Church. Now, um, I'm going to take you over to the coastline (laughs) for this question. Uh, Recently, uh, the California Ocean Protection Council released uh, some data on California's sea level rise. And they have a new scientific model that provided with more certainty on how much ocean levels are going to rise in California in the next 26 years. Uh, And, you know, they talk about 2050, but that is just 26 years away. And um, they say that it will affect 70% of the population in California. And and also, because I read this in the uh, San Francisco Chronicle, I haven't seen it in the Monterey Herald yet, their example was that Humboldt Bay will have a three-foot rise in 26 years, three feet. Are you aware of this new report? And if you are, what do, how does it affect Monterey County? And if you're not, uh, still, how is sea level rise going to affect Monterey County? Well, I, I am not aware of the report, but I'm certainly looking forward to hearing about it now. And my thought on this, just as you said, is yes, we're seeing this. You know, we're seeing this in so many different ways. It it already is having a big impact on our on our area, and yet we are trying hard to do things to try to to, um, to mitigate some of the problems because it isn't just sea water sea level rise. But just as an example, we have two specific areas at the, on our coast in the um, Carmel area that are just really impacted by this. One is the the River Lagoon flooding and the damage done to Scenic Road. And the other is a a project that we're working on that's almost complete, which is the Carmel uh, River Flood Restoration and Environmental Enhancement Project, Carmel River Free, they call it. But these two um, areas are so impacted by the... uh, by the... um, what happens at the coast now and the way that the river runs into the coast and the things that happen there. Everybody knows you shouldn't build in a floodplain. I mean, let's face it, there have been big mistakes about that, and part of the lagoon flooding is the fact that people, you know, uh, 100 years ago, private and public entities um, were building houses. They, they managed the sandbar at the lagoon. They let the water out before it rose high enough to flood the neighboring areas, including the historic agricultural fields and pastures and homes and private businesses. But floods were built in a, in a, in a homes were built in a flood zone. Climate change is making flooding more extreme, in, including rising sea levels. The more severe storms that bring larger swells, and um, those are some of the things that issue, that are at issue. The scenic protections, um, government monies are going toward protecting the homes and public infrastructure but, you know, that is slowly losing stability against nature. Um, even though there's been an, a long ongoing issue, climate change impacts are more severe and they're occurring more often. There are several solutions that we're looking at uh, at the lagoon, and one of them is to raise homes out of the floodplain. Another is to purchase homes in the floodplain and restore it to the, to the natural state. So there are a lot of issues that we're dealing with over at the, uh, at the Carmel Lagoon. The, if you don't mind my going on a little bit longer. Of course, go ahead. The, the Congo River Free Project is fab, it's fabulous. In a partnership with the County of Monterey, the Big Sur Land Trust, um, and the Carmel River floodplain, uh, this project is really something. It's an example of the Big Sur Land Trust's long-term commitment to conservation um, and land in service of community. Um, the, pro- the, um, uh, the project will restore habitat and help significantly reduce the flood risk for home and businesses in the lower Carmel River um, watershed. 
It's one of the most extensive and important multi-benefit flood projects and repairing habitat restoration efforts that we've had on the Central Coast. It uses a, a nature-based green infrastructure solution, how natural is that, that will reclaim the way the river used to go through the southern floodplain to direct the water away from the developed areas north of the river. There are multiple stakeholders, multiple partners. The land was um, originally given to the Big Sur Land Trust by Clint Eastwood, Mark Pete, Clint and uh, Margaret Eastwood. They gave um, a 120-acre um, uh, 120 acre, uh, acres of, uh, of land at the former Adelo property to, um, to do this. So we've got all kinds of people who are involved in this project, and it's, it's very, we're getting really close to, 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 the, to having, the, um, it's, as they call it, shovel ready. So we're looking forward to the hope that construction will begin quite soon. 2025 is the year that we're thinking it's going to be ready to go. The money has come in. We've got had uh, funding from the state, from the feds, from local. It's really been an amazing um, situation. We just that's, got two million dollars. That's that, wonderful, that Mary. Um, I know Mike is fidgeting in his seat with another question. Go, Mike. <laughs> well, I just want to continue on with no the theme of seat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. I just want to continue on with the theme of um, sea level rise. Um, Supervisor Church, Highway 1 through Moss Landing in your district is highly vulnerable to sea level rise, as there are stretches of the highway that appear to be only inches above extreme high tides even now. Can you talk about this vulnerability and what the plan is to address it and how much it will cost? There is a lot of concerns with, um, with uh, sea level rise and the impact it will have on Highway 1. As, as we know, even without sea level rise, we have a, a bottleneck of traffic there from from uh, basically near Watsonville all the way down there towards Castorville uh, because there's there's a four lanes uh, on either side of that and only two lanes there in the middle and that you know, was supposed to be extended to four lanes going back to the uh, to the 50s and it's never been done because of a various um, various things that have come up but uh, there is some initial a million dollars that has just been recently uh, 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 passed the from the state legislature, uh, Assembly Member Don Addis, uh, Senator John Laird were helpful in, in getting this legislation through. And it's sort of a beginning as we begin to deal with what our options are really going to be. So the options are rather are rather limited, uh, which essentially means you've got to move the highway. It has been looked at in some previous reports, and it's not really the, uh, an option to do, or we're going to have to raise it. And the last I saw through an AMBAG study in the late, I don't know if it was 2017 or 2018 or 2019, but somewhere around there, there was an AMBAG study that was done which which laid out uh, several options there. And it basically, they're all costing somewhere around $700, $800 million. Yeah, I'm sure it's a billion dollars by now. I'm sure it'll be a lot more than a billion dollars by the time we ever get around to it. So what we're going to have to do is, is elevate the highway, and that's not a inexpensive proposition. That's really the only option. But other other things that need to be weighed into here too. Uh, the railroad uh, line runs right along the Elkhorn Slough, and that is right now getting flooded quite regularly. And and the railroad is having to to uh, shut down its operations when that's happening. So those are going to have to be addressed. And how that's going to be done is. Well, engineering minds greater than mine will be one so coming forth with the uh, solutions on that. But you point out about Highway One there being very vulnerable, and it really, it really is, and it really is a a, a critical uh, juncture between the Santa Cruz side, the Monterey County um, uh, uh, side of of, of and, and how people travel and back and forth between there along the coastline, but. I've all, you know, while I'm not familiar with the, the study you mentioned earlier about the three foot rise, I've seen multiple other studies that show that we are going to have that rise. Highway one will be flooded. Moss Landing area will be flooded. It's going to come up and hit some of Castorville, and, and that's just the area within my district. And of course, it's going to have an impact on the Elkhorn Sloop, which means that that's, it's the largest inlet body of salt water we have here on the Central Coast, and that's going to rise, and that's going to have an impact. What will that do to the groundwater? 
uh, you know, that, that people need? What will it do for roads? What will it do for um, the native vegetation as, as salt uh, comes in a little bit further? So yeah. it's, it's a real complicated issue, and well, we got to be prepared for it by 2050 or earlier. Well, yeah, one, one thing that to address it. I just don't know if we're doing it quick enough. Great. One, one thing that um, is another um, side effect of sea level rise is it, it increases saltwater intrusion into the groundwater. Absolutely. So that's a real concern as well. Yeah. Well, and the yeah, name of that absolutely. study was also California Ocean Protection Council. They're the ones that released the report, I think, last week. Uh, so just so that you know to take a look at it and see where Monterey County... Supervisor Adams, uh, you have spoken before of the FireWise Communities Program in Monterey County, coming back to yes. wildfires. Can you describe this program and how local residents can become part of it? Well, I'll tell you, it is one of the best things that a person can do to become engaged in a FireWise community. We have, at this point, I can't tell you how many, maybe 25, 30 different uh, neighborhoods that are involved with this. Um, it started because the community association of Big Sur received some county funding to contribute to their fire adapted community programming focus. And FireWise was the way that they chose to go regard defensible space. Um, uh, they, they got a Cal Fire grant to, to do the same thing. The Resource uh, Conser Conser uh, Conservation District also hired someone as a forest health and, and wildfire resilience program person to, to oversee it. The best way to get information on it is to go to the Monterey County website and go to the uh, Department of Emergency Services, and you'll be able to get information on the FireWise community. But we've got them all over, you know, from Ambler Park to the Bluffs to Boots Road to El Caminito Road to Hacienda Carmel to Quail Meadows to Rancho Tierra Grande to Tehama to, to Larcitos to, I like to say this one, Whiskey Gulch. And, uh, to Del Mesa. Uh, uh, and to Del Mesa, yeah. Los Tulare, San Benancio has them, Crowded Sierra has them, um, and they're all over the, the uh, different parts of Glen's district as well. Crowded Sierra has them. Do you have. Uh, and if I, I could jump in on that, I'm a, a little bit familiar with them as well. Uh, before I became on, on a member of the Board of Supervisors, I was president of the uh, Monterey County Fire Safe Council. The Fire Safe Council had one of his, uh, his programs was the promotion of these firewise uh, communities. So, you know, it's, uh, you know, I want to say this is something that I, you, know, you can you can go to the Department of Emergency Management, Monterey County. You can also go to the Monterey County Firewise Council, um, or other um, other people outside of Monterey County, the Santa Cruz uh, County um, uh, um, Fire Safety Council as well would um, uh, sort of be involved into this uh, project. And these are, you know, as Mary's pointed out, and in, in her district is the Carmel Valley and, and, and expanded beyond that, it became extremely popular. It's something anybody as in a community where they can get eight of their neighbors together can do this. And it's something I really recommend, one of these direct actions that individuals can take. It can really help you in preventing, um, preventing fire. You know, two things that I think you get out of this that are very basic, but... I, my understanding is that uh, fire insurance on your home, take a look at whether or not you're in a fire safe community, a fire wise community, I guess, a fire wise community, and that you can um, get a deduction, a lower uh, rate for fire insurance. And in my district, District 5, I'm telling you, people had their fire insurance just chop, chop, chop because they were the, fire, the uh, insurance companies, as everybody well knows, just completely. Uh, just cut people off. They pulled would, out of oh, California. Were, yeah. 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 Pulled yeah. out of California. Yeah. So before our last break, I wanted to ask a very quick question. Has any of uh, the Biden administration infrastructure uh, bill funds come to Monterey County to help with the climate crisis projects here? Well, we received a significant amount of funding from um, a variety of different federal um, resources that we were able to put toward our Department of Emergency Services that were able to um, 
you know, to look at a couple of things. I'm embarrassed that I can't tell you specifically which programs they were, but we have been pleased with the uh, the work that we've been able to do with our federal legislators, particularly Congressman Panetta's office and Bill Lofgren's office as well. They've been very helpful in helping us access funding to be able to address the issues that we have here that climate change is, is bringing about from the highway, from the Big Sur area to the North County area. We've been receiving great support and attention from the federal government, from the Biden administration, so to speak. If you are just joining us, Mike Clancy and I are speaking with our bold guests, Monterey County Supervisors Mary Adams and Glenn Church, about the climate crisis issues in Monterey County. You are listening to Be Bold America on KSQD 90.7 FM, 89.5 and 89.7 FM, Many Voices, One Station. I'm your host, Jill Cody. Hello, K-Squid listeners. I'm Todd Hartman, and each weekday at 4 p.m., I bring you a different perspective on the news than you're likely to hear on most media outlets. Please join me on KSQD Santa Cruz, your ink spot on the dial for the Tom Hartman program. Heard now for the first time ever in the Monterey Bay area at 90.7 FM, weekdays at 4 p.m. That's progressive talking conversation with me, Tom Hartman, weekdays at 4 p.m. on KSQD 90.7 FM. Tag, you're it. We're back. Mike, you have another question. I do. Uh, f- for uh, Supervisor Church, I understand there are problems with both the Nascimento and San Antonio dams in Monterey County. What are these problems, and what does the county plan to do about them? Well, the, the county is taking um, action onto it. It's been involved for some time. You know, we have a problem with the, the San Antonio dam spillway, as I think uh, many of us recall from a few years ago. Again, I think that was the, uh, the 2017 storms. That um, I think that was a 2017 storm, so where the uh, the um, the Orville Dam uh, spillway kind of broke, gave way from there. So it opened up a whole range of concerns uh, about some spillways, and one of those concerns became San Antonio. So there is um, uh, you know, we're, we're seeking federal, we're seeking uh, state funds for this, and uh, we have received some uh, on staff. There is, you know, these dams have been here for 60 years. They they need work onto them. I was down and just visited them last month, I guess it was. And and uh, you know, we we are addressing these concerns onto them. Uh, one of the one of the ideas in terms of trying to go through and and increase our reservoir capacity is there's been talk about a the Inner Lake Tunnel, for example. Um, the two dams are fairly close to each other. The the odd thing with Nacimiento is it's it's a Monterey County dam, and it's not Monterey County, which a lot of people don't realize. It's actually in San Luis Obispo County. So uh, San Antonio is, is in our county, and they're not that far away, but the, um, the, uh, the Interlake Tunnel is to put a tunnel between the two uh, where Don Cimento, which fills up quicker, then would have its, its, uh, it's, 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 overflow, it's yeah. overflow, it's extra water, mm-hmm. went to San Antonio, which rarely fills up to its capacity. So this is this is one of the um, one of the things that's being viewed as uh, as a way to increase storage. The you know obstacles we face in many of this stuff is that it's very expensive. The Department of Dams Management has been on us um, that we have got to fix the dam, period. So we've got to we have to do that. Um, I think as Glenn was talking about the Interlake Tunnel, one of the other things is that it allows for better um, management of the Salinas River. Because right now, when San Antonio, I mean, when uh, Nacimiento is full, they have to release water. And that eventually ends up with our sending clear water out to the ocean because we have no place to capture it and store it. But if we had this other um, big storage area of Lake San Antonio, we wouldn't have that issue. And many, much of our, as, kind of, as everybody knows, our water issues are just horrible here, both in the Salina side and in the, in the Carmel side. One of the things that I have to say is that until we look at solving our water problem as a regional effort, we're not going to get any place. The idea of a lettuce curtain that divides our county has got to be completely torn down and thrown aside so that we can come up with a water solution that will work for every part of our county. And, and if I want to just kind of add on to that in terms of the water storage, some of the, 
I, I'm sitting uh, as, as a member on this Lena Scully Basin Groundwater Sustainability Agency, which is one of the agencies that I referred to uh, earlier. That I think there's 200 of them throughout the state. They're dealing dealing with uh, areas where there's a uh, overdraft of the groundwater basins that have to have basically a balanced uh, a balanced approach by 2040, where there's as much water going out as there is going in. One of the projects that we're looking at in terms of trying to recharge these basins and sort of a, a mini storage is the creation of these uh, retention ponds. I uh, just was had a meeting last uh, Friday, it was, uh, about uh, uh, putting a retention pond out in the Folsom Knolls area, which um, most of you uh, listeners probably don't know where it is, but it's an area just north of Salinas, uh, where a, a, a creek flows through and often floods a community there. But we're talking about developing up a, a, a retention pond there that will catch the water when it's flowing in high quantities and, and, and capture it. And then, it will, because it's rather, relatively sandy soil, it'll flow into the uh, um, into the ground and recharge the basin. Uh, that would, you know, the kind of things we need at that small level everywhere, mm -hmm. uh, not just these big dams, but we need to have this everywhere. Because one thing I think we have to realize, and um, throughout the Monterey Bay area, is that there was, there was a lot of small ponds, small waterways, if you uh, existing here 200, 300 years ago before uh, much of this land was um, was uh, settled through um, uh, through the Spanish and, and Americans, uh, uh, um, the Mexicans coming on in here at times. And this is um, this is what um, this is you know kind of approach the small scale approach that we really kind of need to really be able to deal with this. Mary, um, yeah, this uh, this uh, interview is uh, then made into a podcast and put out, and we, I have. People listening in many other countries. Could you define lettuce curtain? Ah, I will do. Yes, um, Monterey County is um, a big county, very large county, and there is a it's a, a um, hypothetical divide that separates the Monterey Peninsula, which is primarily top, the top uh, um, uh, economic engine is tourism. It's the coast. It's the golf courses. It's the beautiful coastline that goes all the way down to Big Sur. The Salinas Valley is the economic engine that is based on agriculture. It's inland. It's drier. There are mountains there. There are um, beautiful fertile fields there. There is a hypothetical line that is called the lettuce curtain because lettuce is the primary uh, crop that's grown. And so it, it, the term that we use is that there is a, a divide between the Monterey Peninsula and the Salinas Valley. And, and is Salinas Valley like, also called the salad bowl of the world? Yes, it's the salad bowl of the world, yes. Yeah, I'd just like to make a quick comment before I ask my question. I, I really like what I'm hearing here. I really do. Particularly the part about uh, we need a regional solution to the water problem. That is absolutely right. You're right on target there, Mary, with that. And um, also, uh, uh, Supervisor Church, um, the idea of these, these retention ponds, that's a great idea. It's part of what's generally referred to as stormwater capture. That's got to be part of the overall solution. And uh, we really need to pursue those kinds of things because the long-term trend is increasing drought punctuated by occasional atmospheric river events, which dump lots and lots of water on our area, most of which goes right back out to the ocean. So um, that's the kind of thing we need to pursue. So a question for... Uh, I, um, I, I absolutely, if I just jump in, I absolutely agree, Mike. Yes. It's actually something I'm trying to uh, push forth. I've had discussions, uh, particularly out in the North County area, about uh, trying to increase these because I believe you look at some old Portola's old logs when and he came through here in the 1700s, he spoke of the many ponds that used to exist throughout this area. Yeah, that's great. You know, so Mike, hope you'll uh, me. Mike and Mary and uh, Glenn, we have two minutes till the end of the program and... I wanted to ask you in these last few minutes what, um, you know, people who live in Monterey County, uh, uh, that all, what all of us might be able to keep doing, stop doing, start doing as they relate to the challenges that you face countywide. Do you have, our future depends on it. So do you have some ideas for us? Well, one thing I want to say is that I am very, very thankful to have a colleague like Supervisor Glenn Church because he sees the same things that that we do. He agrees with this regional solution to our water problem. 
and he's willing to work with me from his side of the county, the northern part, with us to be able to come up with something. As far as what I would see, I mean, I've got little baby things to say. If you use single plastic, stop doing it. And if you have a big gas-guzzling car, take a look at getting an electric one. Amen. <laughs> Glenn? I'm going to I'm going to jump in there again, kind of put another plug for the FireWise community then, as I did a little bit earlier. But, I, you know, there, there's a lot, of, a lot of different approaches we could take on this. You and Mary both expressed uh, concerns about uh, uh, Monterey pine trees that had fallen down and, uh, in your area. And, you know, those are some of the, the simple things that we have to kind of look at. Monterey pine, like Monterey cypress, are shallow-rooted. They're going to be very vulnerable to this saturated soils, and then we get heavy rains coming in. So, you know, these little things that we can do to protect this is like looking and saying, you know, I'm, you know, I'm all for planting all the moderate pine we can around, but maybe plant them away from or from a dwelling. If you're going to put a tree near a, a dwelling, find something that's going to be a little deeper rooted. Mm -hmm. uh, these are important things I think that we need to do. I think, you know, in terms of what people are doing, a lot of people need to keep going with the whole the whole path that they're doing on recycling, for example, it's, uh, um, you know, it's more you recycle, the less there, there is an impact upon, uh, upon the environment and forests and, and, and everything. And, you know, well, Mary and Glenn, well, thank you so much for being our bold and impressive uh, interview guest today. <laughs> and in these times when our, uh, there are so many out there screaming, uh, they don't believe in a democratic government. I think they should be proud of Monterey County. I have to say I feel our Monterey County is in good leadership hands. Thank you for joining us on Be Bold America today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Be careful, everyone. Thank you. What's next on Be Bold America? Please join us on Sunday, February 25th, when we will be discussing Tao of Surfing, Finding Depth, at low tide. This interview will take you on a journey into the recesses of your soul and explores the ontological question, what is our underlying essence? Internationally acclaimed Pulitzer Prize nominated and local author and filmmaker Michael A. Allen uses the metaphor of the sea and its ebb and flow to describe the Tao of life cycle. And he discovers within this unique reflection a new way to comfort and heal the self from the trauma of death. Michael was inspired to write Tao of Surfing after his lifelong best friend and surfing partner suddenly came out as gay and died from AIDS in 1989. The book subsequently became the basis for the soon-to-be-released feature film, A Long Road to Tao, which Michael co-wrote and produced. Michael Allen will be joined by a Long Road to Tao cast member and fellow surfer, Mike Clancy, to discuss the book, the making of the film, the politics surround, surrounding the AIDS crisis of the 1980s, and how the film relates to political issues facing the LGBTQ community today. So listen to Tao of Surfing, Finding Depth at Low Tide by joining Be Bold America on Sunday, February 25th at 5 p.m. As a reminder, Be Bold America is available as a podcast. Now you may listen to the show anytime for free by subscribing through your favorite podcast platform. I want to give a special thank you to Be Bold America's program engineer, Yanko, and to our station's program director, Howard Falstein, and to my guest co-host, Mike Clancy, frequent lecturer on the climate crisis and who currently serves as the chair of the Monterey County chapter of the Citizens Climate Lobby. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Jill. This was a lot of fun. We had two great guests. You are listening to KSQD Santa Cruz, Many Voices, One Station. Listen worldwide online at ksqd.org. My name is Jill Cody, and thank you for listening to Be Bold America. Until next time, keep, stop, start. <laughs>